tall tale retold and illustrated by Stephen Kellogg. A tall tale means that somebody made it even better with the telling. It was ben Benjamin's gift in 1988. Look at all the apples. We talked before about how we like how Stephen Kellogg illustrates all the detail and the fine lines. John Chapman, who later became known as Johnny Appleseed, was born on September 26, 1774, when the apples on the trees surrounding his home in Leominster, Massachusetts, were as red as the autumn leaves. You see how the apples and the leaves are similar? John's first years were hard. His father left the family to fight in the Revolutionary War, and his mother and his baby brother both died before his second birthday. Oh, my. By the time John turned six, his father had remarried and settled in Longmeadow, Massachusetts. Within a decade, their little house was overflowing with ten more children. So he would be the older one over here. Nearby was an apple orchard. Like most early American families, the Chapmans picked their apples in the fall, stored them in the cellar for winter eating, and used them to make sauces, cider, vinegar, and apple butter. John loved to watch the spring blossoms slowly turn into glowing fruit of autumn. This is a bluebird, and this is a blue jay. Lots of things to find in the pictures. And funny things. You don't usually think about the animals being on the roof. Watching the apples grow inspired in John a love of all of nature. He often escaped from his boisterous household to the tranquil wo woods. The animals sensed his gentleness and trusted him. Pretty cool that the deer come right up to him. And the rabbits and the robin. As soon as John was old enough to leave home, he set out to explore the vast wilderness to the west. When he reached the Allegheny Mountains, he cleared a plot of land, planted a small orchard with the pouch of apple seeds he carried with him. Nowadays, the first thing I think about is how big that tree is that got cut down. John walked hundreds of miles through the Pennsylvania forest, living like the Indians he befriended on the trail. And as he traveled, he cleared the land for many more orchards. He was sure the pioneer families would be arriving before long, and he looked forward to supplying them with apple trees. I see a moose and a raccoon. What kind of cat is this? Don't know, raccoon. Ooh, an otter, moose, geese. When a storm struck, he found shelter in a hollow log or built a lean-to. On clear nights, he stretched out under the stars. Over the next few years, John continued to visit and care for his orchards. The winters slowed him down, but he survived happily on a diet of butternuts. Goodness, look at where he is. Is he living under a snowbank? One spring, he met a band of men who boasted that they could lick their weight in wildcats. They were, they were amazed to hear that John wouldn't hurt an animal and had no use for a gun. He wants to save the animals and they want to shoot. They challenged John to, a com to compete at wrestling, the favorite frontier sport. He suggested a more practical contest, a tree chopping match. The woodsmen eagerly agreed. Oh, now this is where it's fun to look at the book in person. There's so much happening. This guy got bonked on the head. Here's somebody's foot. Wow, oh dear, I hope he's gonna be okay. <laughs> There's a raccoon. When the sawdust settled, there was no question about who had come out on top. 
John was pleased that the land for his largest orchard had been so quickly cleared. <coughs> he thanked the exhausted woodsmen for their help and began planting. During the next few years, John continued to move westward. Whenever he ran out of apple seeds, he hiked to the eastern cider presses to replenish his supply. And before long, John's plantings were spread across the state of Ohio. So beautiful. The sun's going down. You can see the bald eagles. Meanwhile, pioneer families were arriving in search of home sites and farmland. John had located his orchards on the routes he thought they'd be traveling. As he had hoped, the settlers were eager to buy his young trees. So he, they could buy a tree that's already um, sprouted, and they could plant it to their at their new home. What a good idea. John went out of his way to lend a helping hand to his new neighbors. Often he would give his trees away. People affectionately called him Johnny Appleseed and he began using that name. He's helping make the house. He particularly, lo particularly enjoyed entertaining children with tales of his ad wilderness adventures and stories from the Bible. <laughs> in 1812, the British incited the Indians to join them in another war against the Americans. The settlers feared that Ohio would be invaded from Lake Erie. It grieved Johnny that his friends were fighting each other, but when he saw the smoke of burning cabins, he ran through the night shouting a warning at every door. After the war, people urged Johnny to build a house and settle down. He replied that he lived like a king in his wilderness home, and he returned to the forest he loved. During the long, his long absences, folks enjoyed sharing their recollections of Johnny. They retold his stories, and sometimes they even exaggerated it, it, uh, them a bit. When they exaggerate it, that's what makes it into a tall tale. Some recalled Johnny sleeping on a treetop hammock and chatting with the birds. Could that be right? Others remembered that a rattlesnake had attacked his foot. Fortunately, Johnny's feet were as tough as an elephant's hide, so the fangs couldn't even get into his feet. <laughs> that Could that be right? It was said that Johnny had once tended a wound, wounded wolf and then kept him for a pet. An old hunter swore he'd seen Johnny frolicking with a family, a bear family. I don't know. The storytellers outdid each other with tall tales about his feats of survival in the untamed wilderness. Ooh, another one of these amazing pictures. Big fish, and there's his boat. Went over a waterfall. Oh my, that's a scary part. <laughs> oh look, there's an apple. The eagle's got us. As the years passed, Ohio became too crowded for Johnny. He moved to the wilds of Indiana where he continued to clear the land for his orchards. And when the settlers began arriving, Johnny recognized some of the children who had listened to his stories and now they had children of their own. That was cool. It made Johnny's old heart glad when they welcomed him as a beloved friend and asked to hear his stories again. When Johnny passed 70, it became difficult for him to keep up with his work. Then in March of 1845, while trudging through a snowstorm near Fort Wayne, Indiana, he became ill for the first time in his life. Johnny asked for shelter in a settler's cabin, and a few days later, he died there. Curiously, Johnny's stories continued to move westward without him. Folks maintained that they'd seen him in Illinois, or that he greeted them in Missouri, Arkansas, or Texas. Others were certain that he'd planted trees on the slopes of Rocky Mount, on the on the slopes of the Rocky Mountains, or in California's distant valleys. Even today, people still claim they've seen. Johnny Appleseed.
Well, I'm sure they've seen his apples. Big apples.